Oh, wonderful. We've got people logging in. Hello, everybody out there on the internet. Welcome. Wonderful. So happy to see everybody logging in. I'm Sophie Wadzak. I'm the research communication specialist for the DET. And we're just going to give people a few minutes to, to log in. And um, very shortly, I will introduce my colleague, Anthony Coonan. Um, but in the meanwhile, I'm just going to launch a casual poll because we want to know what it was about this webinar that, that attracted all of you out there. So I'm launching a, a poll and Take, take a minute and you can respond to it while we're waiting for the rest of our guests to join us. And Eunice, I'll probably give people, you know, two, two three more minutes to, to log in, but we've got more and more people all the time. People logging in. Yes, we've got many people joining us, and I'm just going to give people a little bit longer. I'm going to give everybody another minute. Um, in the chat, I see. It. Yes, we're coming to you from from. I'm coming to you from Pittsburgh, PA. But this is actually a pretty a far flung panel that you see before you. Um, and I'll introduce my colleague Anthony in just a moment, and he can tell you more about this webinar series. Um, it's so nice to see so many of you here, and thank you for those of you who've replied to the poll already. All right, it's 1.31. I'm gonna give it one more minute. Welcome to those of you who are just joining. We're about to kick off our first webinar. Very excited to have you here. Jim says you can't see the panel. Jim in the chat, can you, can you see our faces or not? This is a question for, for James Papura and anybody, and anybody who wants to. <laughs> Only us. Okay, okay. So it's I think it's set to just, just show whoever is speaking. And that's fine because shortly it will be Eunice speaking and she can she can take it away. Um let's see. We still have people joining, so I'm inclined to give us just a another minute to wait for people to begin. And um, and I will be we will be recording this webinar, so we'll this will be available after the fact if people want to tune back in or share it with those, you know, colleagues who were not able to attend at this time. Okay, I'm watching our little participant number. If it stops moving, then that will mean that I think we can begin. <laughs> um, let's see. It's one thirty-two. I think we can maybe start. Anthony, are you ready for me to to introduce yes. you? Wonderful. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I want to say welcome to all of you out there to this, which is our first installment of the Duolingo English Tests webinar series, Innovations in Language Assessment. And um, to, to begin, I want to introduce, first of all, I'm Sophie Wadzak. I'm the Research Communication Specialist for the Duolingo English Test, and I'm honored to introduce my colleague, Dr. Ner Dr. Anthony John Coonan, who will tell you a little bit more about this series and introduce our speaker. So I'm going to start recording the webinar. We've got it's okay, good. We've got it. All right. So Anthony, take it away. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to all of you, wherever you are. Welcome to this uh, uh, webinar series hosted by Duolingo. Our first speaker is um, Dr. Eunice Chang from the University of T T Toronto. I will say a little bit about her, but I also want to say that this is going to be a regular series um, uh, called uh, Innovations in Language Assessment. And we are interested in uh, inviting speakers uh, to talk about their innovations. Today's talk is by uh, uh, Eunice Chang, as I said earlier. She is a professor at the Department of Applied Psychology and Human Development in the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. Uh, she has specialized in areas such as diagnostic language assessment, technology-rich uh, assessment design, valid and fair assessment practices for high-stakes high testing, um, mixed method research, and so on. Uh, she has held uh, many positions 
uh, in um, uh, in the academy, as well as she is a um, member of the uh, <clears throat> um, uh, editorial board of Language Assessment Quarterly. She's the author of a book called Focus on Assessment by Oxford University Press. And she's the co-author of a research monograph, OECD Reviews on Evaluation and Assessment in Education, published in Denmark. She was also a recipient uh, of an outstanding research article of, for the year in the year 2013 in the journal Language Learning. Uh, she also currently serves um, with uh, much difficulty, I can imagine juggling all of these things, as the secretary of the International Language Testing Association. So um, uh, there's a lot more to say about Eunice, but I think we would like to hear her rather than me. So I will stop here from, uh, for now and uh, welcome um, Eunice uh, to start her presentation. Thank you, Eunice. Unmute. Okay. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, I, it's really hard to, because I, I can't see anyone, um, just me. So thank you so much for joining the webinar. Dear Lingo colleagues, many thanks for your invitation and support. Um, it's really, truly my honor, actually, to be the first speaker of this um, amazing webinar series. And I understand Jim is coming next. And so, um, you know, today, I'd like to talk about the power of diagnostic feedback in learning-oriented assessment. And uh, as you can see, I start with this term, the butterfly effect. Yeah, so one of my grade six students, uh, she has trouble organizing her thoughts and sort of planning her writing, but she is a good oral storyteller. So she was writing about um, her trick-or-treating and how she got lost while she was trick-or-treating, but the page was blank. So I said, why don't I try booting up uh, the voice to text feature on Google Docs? And she didn't know what it was, but I booted it up and showed her. And I said, just keep telling the story just like you were telling it to me and it will record it for you. And so she said, okay, I clicked record and she started to tell the story. She said a couple words and then she said, she was floored because she saw the words that she said on the screen and she froze and she said, oh my gosh, it's working. And it started typing what she said there. <laughs> she covered her mouth, you know, so she was so excited to be, uh, to see her, her words on the screen that she was completely floored and she, she stopped. Yeah. So this was the conversation taken from the uh, teacher interview uh, as part of the project and, um, this leads me to sort of thinking about the butterfly fact that I wanted to use in the title. So it was Edward Lawrence and a half century ago that a small change such as a rounding off one variable actually was the decimal point, decimal point in his simulation transformed the whole pattern in his simulated weather, for, weather forecasting. And known as a butterfly fact, his idea highlights how small changes to the initial condition in a complex and chaotic system leads to a larger and unexpected impact. So my question for you, do you think the wonder this child ex experienced with speech to text AI technology may serve as a little flap of a butterfly's wings leading to much bigger effects on her growth? So mediated feedback and you know, here we are thinking of you know, what feedback really can do for our education, for assessment. So why is this so significant? In education, let's think about our individual learners as a dynamical and chaotic system. And as the, the little figure up upper uh, right-hand side indicates, the constant interactions and, and adaptations among these individual learners facilitate their self-organization. It is the development they, they, they learn to develop and, and organize themselves around and interactions. And then as a result of such interactions, the pattern emerges at a macro level as a result and feedback as a mechanism. And feedback is the enabler of such uh, pattern emergence. So changes are really amplified by positive feedback or dampened by negative feedback. 
And I, again, in this room, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that many of you are familiar with this complexity theory. And I just wanted to start uh, my talk by sort of uh, grounding it in these broad ideas. So the fully, to fully benefit from the power of feedback for change, we need to think about reculturing assessment. Unfortunately, negative stigmas about assessment that occupy newspaper headlines, we saw SAT, uh, you know, most recent headline making, teacher staff meetings, family conversations over dinner, you know, most recent uh, teacher sort of uh, staff meeting we attended, teachers were complaining pretty much and telling us how tiring it is to assess and we're assessing enough, I know enough, how much more should we assess and that kind of conversation happens everywhere. So that really just again reminds me why we really need to reculture assessment by, attend, uh, by attending to the actionable assessment from just the sake for the sake of assessment through a feedback loop, right? So if you think about a feedback driven assessment really it can really close gaps that we have about standardized, you know, uh, high stakes versus low stakes and high stakes, you know, uh, standardized versus classroom based assessment. And I think the feedback as a core element of assessment that really grounds all activities around, I think, can really uh, help us to move forward our conversations. So, and this reculturing assessment requires a very high level also of system level thinking as there are so many moving parts when we think about how to change assessment culture. So feedback. So there are many dimensions of feedback that we need to think about. Um, so first, let's consider its agency. You know, who are the recipients of feedback in terms of individual or group, learner, teacher, parent, or even system at the macro level? And next is the source. Who provides feedback, self, external, right? Or in this case now, human or the machine. Um, the third dimension is mechanism. You know, what constitutes the content of feedback? Is it evaluative against the group average or mastery against the a set, you know, criteria uh, or standards? Um, feedback delivery can be also, you know, uh, you know, we need to think about how we deliver feedback in terms of temporality, which is the timing of uh, feedback, you know, when uh, feedback will maximize its potential effects, right? So this feedback immediacy refers to how fast feedback should be provided in, in relation to the performance it follows. This temporary dimension further concerns intensity of feedback, right? The grain size. And typically research shows that the feedback, you know, either in terms of timing, the sooner the better, and the more the better. But really um, both need to be really uh, further uh, empirically uh, validated. So let us first think about feedback through CDM or DCM. So I would probably use the both terms more interchangeably. So CDM, cognitive diagnostic modeling, DCM, diagnostic classification modeling. So let's think about the source of feedback, how we derive feedback from assessment, specifically in this case, cognitive diagnostic modeling. So since uh, Tasuka's early rules-based modeling introduced the concept of Q matrix as a way to map items with skills, the work of CDM has gained its momentum and researched and applied to real uh, life assessment context productively. When I was first introduced to, to CDM, 1995 uh, Nichols, Chipman and Brannon's book was a uh, just textbook for me. <laughs> and, uh, and 2010, uh, Rob et al's book uh, represented sort of the heyday of the uh, CDM work. Um, 19, uh, 2019, uh, handbook by diagnostic classification model by, um, you know, Bon Devier's book expanded it actually further, you know, with explanatory sort of modeling approaches that are just fascinating. And advances um, AI in AI prompted us further now to collaborate, to integrate knowledge from interdisciplinary communities, which led to computational psychometrics. The term was coined by Von Davier. So this is really exciting time. You know, it's not a small span of time, actually, it's a quite a large, you know, a, a pretty long period of time that we actually went through. And uh, so now one trend that I see across these you know, uh, periods 
um, is this explainable modeling. It is seen in really interesting work in psychometric modeling itself that the psychometric modeling does not just describe the performance data, but also it explains them with contextual variables. So explanatory IRT model, uh, obviously it's not really recent, right? Because the recent work has already uh, appeared 2008. Um, but using latent regression, you know, LNTM model allows for actually, we can simultaneously incorporate the person and, and item uh, predictors into our IRT uh, parameter estimation. Um, it, you know, if you think about diff, traditional diff approach now, we don't really need to think too much about how to, you know, whether or not to remove diff reflect items actually out of our, uh, from our test parity. Now we can consider incorporate that effect into our estimation process. Um, another really interesting work is Bayesian IIT approach where, you know, it allows us to, again, to incorporate priors it's about the, the, the knowledge that we have about learners or you know, test items so that we actually can incorporate those priors into the estimation of a posterior distribution, which can contribute to reducing the test length as well as measurement errors. Uh, the last explanatory modeling approach is appearing in CDM. Um, so, you know, Von Davies, Park, and Lee, and uh, again, there are some amazing, you know, groups of people doing amazing work again. So, you know, Park and Lee um, um, is 2008-19 um, explanatory CDM work actually shows. So what they did was actually they incorporated test taker self-concepts, such as confidence, affect, also, they included the observable variable, which is whether or not the students have a calculator, whether they own a calculator. So they incorporate these additional latent and observable uh, variables as a covariates in their CDM skill mastery uh, estimation, and then found that those covariates actually had in fact the effects on the a specific, not all, but uh, as, as certain specific uh, attributes. So that's also very interesting work. And I, I see this explainability and or trying to make our psychometric models explainable by considering those contextual variables. I think it is quite fascinating um, trend. Another trend that I see in the fields is a shifting from more spreadsheet based sort of presentation and thinking to more data cubes. Again, not my word. <laughs> it's again, uh, Von Davier's work. And uh, as mentioned earlier, Von Davier introduced the concept of computational psychometrics that captures the convergence of interdisciplinary work, subsuming theory driven psychometrics, well, CDM is the case, and also person-oriented modeling approach. We saw the latent class, latent person in you know, a profile uh, modeling approach, you know, and also data science approach and machine learning uh, approach as well. So these digital first assessment design really affords a shift from mono and unidimensional representation of our data in the form of spreadsheet uh, on the left-hand side toward the data cubes by considering multimodal which includes visual data, audio data, text, speech, sensory, video, and also multi-channel data. You know, are we collecting data through digitally synchronously web apps, X and Y and Z, and also multi-agents as well, and across different time points. So, and how to really handle such massive multimodal, multi-channel data? If you if we stick with the spreadsheet, really, we can't really conceptualize such, right? So. I think data cubes idea is again is really uh, uh, sort of sums up uh, the the excitement as well as challenge we have and this whole idea of uh, computational psychometrics really helps us to conceptualize our uh, modeling approach. Now back to CDM. Uh, CDM is a family of multidimensional item response theory, but not latent trait, but class model. So CDM it is confirmatory in a sense that knowledge and skills are required for successful item performance are pre-specified uh, using uh, item by skill Q matrix. And similar latent class model, um, LCA, LPA are also used, um, but those are more exploratory, meaning you know, the, the set number of uh, latent classes or profiles are not known a priori. Of course, you can make that more explanatory, but um, that's the key distinction uh, between these two. So CDM typically starts with cognitively engineered task design, 
uh, grounded in, of course, reach understandings of cognitive processes. And we do uh, put a lot of effort in uh, understanding uh, cognitive processes underlying the task performance. So successful CDM application really de depends on that the Q matrix, the quality of the Q matrix and defensible Q matrix, you know, whether or not the content of the Q matrix is really theoretically sound and also psychometrically defensible, because if you have too few items per skill, you're going to have a reliability problem right there. Um, the grain size of the Q has a huge implication uh, uh, for pedagogical actionability, you know, whether or not 15 I, you know, skills included in your Q are really actionable by our users, right? So, and up, up and you know, uh, development of the Q and also further iterative, you know, uh, refinement of the Q matrix. Then you determine, you know, very you consider various uh, existing CDM models, and there are lots of different models. You know, some complex, you know, uh, less. The key distinction uh, that you have to consider, or well, we have to consider, uh, in selecting proper models is the interskill relationships that the, each model sort of assumes you know, conjunctive versus, you know, a compensatory model that uh, many of you are familiar with by now. Um, so, you know, usually typical uh, approach is now, uh, you don't have to marry one model, right? So you might want to consider a different modeling approaches. And also there are some other models that are not necessarily uh, tied to a specific uh, modeling assumptions. Anthony, do you need to say something? Uh, no, 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 nothing. Just go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, the outcome of the CDM application is the skill mastery probabilities. Actually, you do get the probabilistic uh, sort of estimation of each skill mastery level. Um, so that the probabilities, of course, run from zero to one. So what that means is we want to turn those probabilities into classifications by applying a certain cutoffs. And that's where the dilemma comes, right? So is it 50%, you know, as a cutoff or 60%, you know, how do we really incorporate the uh, margin of error and things like that? So um, those are bits are arbitrary, um, as you know. The, so once we determine the skill mastery probabilities and then transform them into the skill uh, mastery classes, and then each class represents a very distinct uh, multidimensional uh, class and differentiated um, you know, in terms of the combination of mastered or not mastered skills. And then of course, the next step is here now, we translate that into the feedback report or feedback, and then evaluates how such feedback can be further utilized. I'm just gonna skip these details. So one of the uh, very common questions that I um, ask myself and as well as others um, is this, how do you determine the grain size of the Q, right? Um, I was obsessed with theory in the past, you know, if I think about when I think about my first uh, CDM work, I was looking for the answer from the theory and the literature. Um, and as you can see, <laughs> You know, my CDM work with TOEFL, EQAO, the provincial uh, leading the literacy assessment, and then, you know, recent IELTS work. And now more, forget about retrofit, let's build our own. So building own, um, you know, uh, uh, assessment uh, sort of platform using digital, uh, is a digital first assessment. And as you can see that there's an interesting pattern, right? So the pattern here is actually the number of skills is decreasing. And why? Uh, two reasons. Uh, one is um, actually more precise assessment, more items, right? Require more items and, um, and we don't want that, right? So I think uh, the, 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 the trend is really how to really uh, uh, maximize our precision uh, without uh, increasing the lengths. So um, the fewer skills, uh, yeah, fewer items, or if you have a set items, then more items for precision. And also, I think the more important uh, reason for actually decreasing or, 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 or preferring the smaller number of uh, skills is really actionability. You know, when you um, communicate actually uh, students, you know, uh, mastery level of six different skills, uh, we learn teachers and students really cannot pay attention to all it's a lot. 
So uh, right now, the, the key idea is really what are the core skills that are in this case, in a more curriculum setting, then what are the core skills that the schools highlight and the curriculum highlights and X and Z, and why don't we focus on those? You know? um, so yeah, the next question is really, can any task function as diagnostic? And again, I think the field has had enough conversations about the, you know, how many tasks really was designed for diagnostic purposes from the get-go, right? So the, um, when we consider different tasks for diagnostic purposes and applying CVM approaches again, are how these items really function for diagnostic purposes. So, you know, items need to have a very clear skill definitions, right? Um, and uh, so in, in such a way that the, the items can really provide a diagnostically you know, highly discriminating actually capacity to differentiate masters from non-masters. So this plot, I, again, not the first time using this plot, and shows the item level proportion correct uh, responses between um, masters and non-masters. And, and we like to see a very clearly non-overlapping um, uh, separation, you know, uh, between masters and non-masters in their uh, conditional proportion correct scores, right? Now, when it comes to the reporting, and uh, and I think it is also a very important question. You know, how to really facilitate communication using uh, CDF? Um, this report was delivered in a paper pencil format a long time ago, um, and then the evaluation uh, validation project back then was mainly focusing on the change in test scores between uh, pre and post instruction and uh, 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 feedback as a uh, uh, intervention. Um, so really not really paying attention to or not able to address the how actually different components of feedback were really processed and uh, perceived by users. So interesting work done by Dunlop 2017. So her dissertation examined the very nature of feedback processing, especially how attention is distributed to different components of feedback. So she considered attention as a prerequisite to feedback processing and a collective various data, including adult immigrant participants, reading performance data, surveys, eye tracking, delayed stimulated recall. I think it, she had about months long delay. So here's a CDF uh, report. So she did a CDM modeling and then she delivered the report highlighting different skill uh, mastery levels uh, for individual users. Her study, so she triangulated uh, three main data sources in this case to really understand how testic or the study participants uh, distribute their attention to different uh, components of the feedback, self reports. So uh, participants reported uh, how much time or which part actually they spend most of the time right after uh, receiving the feedback. And then I track and a month later, delayed the call. So the participants self-report, and then the, the slide shows actually, uh, you know, which component actually was uh, uh, received the most attention according to the order. So the participants self-report indicated they spent most more time on suggestions and plans, followed by figures. Unfortunately, CDF appears at the end. However, the fixation data indicates that on average, participants spend slightly more time on the skill description. Actually, skill description um, uh, comes first. Um, about the same amount of uh, uh, fixation uh, uh, on suggestions and plans as well. So Dunlop rightly explains the time spent is not directly related to attention, cognitive attention, because if you know certain section has heavy text, that will require more time, but doesn't, you know, uh, mean that they are processing, you know, uh, uh, more cognitively actively. So the immediate self-report after the receipt of feedback reflects actual attention, not the amount of time spent. So the long-term recall actually shows that people remembered figures first, followed by suggestions and plans again, consistent with the existing literature of visual processing and attention. So, so she also mentioned that personalized the suggestions for learning and planning, because where the suggestions and plan comes actually, and that people tend to remember the sections that are personalized. And again, really highlighting the importance of 
presenting and delivering and facilitating communications with the personalized feedback. And uh, the, the study finding also showed that how feedback processing really differs actually by learner proficiency levels, right? So for the low mastery class, for example, here on the left-hand side, there isn't really much to see in those figures, therefore less attention, you know, uh, or fixation um, as well. Um, so, and then the right-hand side, the high skill mastery class student actually, yeah, fixates more on the text as well as figures. So there is the interaction effect. Now, despite the potential fine-grained diagnostic feedback from CDM that I just went over, um, standardized language testing programs are typically uh, still based on the unidimensional continuous traits uh, scales of theta, separated oftentimes by modalities so that they produce also subscores. Um, and largely because uh, a decision-making is typically done uh, based on the cutoff score, not at the skill level. So those skill mesh profiles from CDN can provide a detailed information about what specific skills students have mastered or have not mastered. Multidimensional item response theory also can uh, supply such information, but because of the game modeling complexity, um, um, it is not the case. So in this study, this particular study, uh, which appears uh, in its research report. Um, so we, what we did was we triangulated actually CDM applications with a unidimensional scale anchoring method. Um, so the purpose of the, uh, was the study, purpose of the study was much broader in scope as we were interested in examining actually how um, IELTS band scores were interpreted by test takers and also uh, university faculty and staff members. So the finding a way, tried to find a way to enrich uh, their score interpretations beyond just the band scores. Um, so the final Q metrics, you know, for the reading subtest included three skills, basic comprehension, global summary, and inferential reasoning. So from multiple CDM fit to the data, so we tested uh, five different uh, models and we estimated posterior skill mastery uh, probabilities from GDNA model, which is the general uh, model that doesn't necessarily, you know, assume a typical inter-skill uh, assumptions, relationships. Um, and um, so as you suspected, of course, uh, retrofitting CDM to existing uh, test data results in imbalance. I think the most problem is, the biggest problem is the, the imbalance of the skill uh, by item distribution. So, um, you know, basic comprehension tend to be uh, dominant um, and most of items were measuring one skill over the others, right? So that was a gain achieved and that wasn't just this study's finding, I think it was well reported in the literature. So considering different psychometric parameterization and anyhow, so you see the how the different CDM models kind of fit the data. Anyway, so based on the uh, final model fit and um, here's the key finding. So the relationship between IELTS reading band scores on the x-axis, you see that. Um, so uh 4.5 5 5.5 and 6 6 so usually the uh university most of the programs at u of t for example um uh use 6.5 as a their cutoff um typically for cut score the uh, sub scores as well as um, global scores um and then now you're looking at the uh, uh, skill mastery probabilities. Y axis is a, a skill mastery probability. Um, so overall, as you can see, the order of mastery level is actually global followed by basic comprehension and inferential. So inferential becoming um, harder to master. Now, if you look at the um, Another way to uh, sort of uh, look at the uh, skill mastery uh, probability values again, uh, the color doesn't show here on the right hand side plot. And as you can see, uh, when we apply 0.5 cutoff, uh, inferential skill is the one that doesn't really show a clear evidence of a mastery at the band score 6.5. Um, another way to look at this is. Um, you know, you look at the uh, mastery of uh, 111, meaning it's a class that master all three skills, uh, including inferential, and that appears band score seven. And if you look at 6.5 band score, 
clearly, again, 101, which is, again, lacking inferential uh, reasoning mastery, and that's the most dominant uh, skill mastery class at the cuff. Uh, so what, that, what does this mean? And the focus group with a faculty and, and our international students, again, confirmed that the most critical challenge the student, international students face uh, post admission is the ability to make inferences and, and think critically. And so we further triangulated the CDM work with a scale anchoring method. Uh, scale anchoring method has been used for larger scale testing, such as National Assessment for Educational Progress. Uh, Bitten and Allen um, and also uh, Shinari also produce, uh, uh, published a work on this. So as a way to mitigate pressure to provide a proficiency descriptors across different performance levels or anchor points beyond the overall test discourse. So you can't really go for the multidimensional uh, you know, IIT or CDM, you're still with the uh, theta-based uh, report, then can you further elaborate on what the you know, score points mean? So that's the scale anchoring method. So typical scale anchoring method, in this case, I'm just talking about direct scale anchoring method. You first group test takers according to their specific anchor levels. Like in IELTS case, we use the band scores as anchor points because they're already established. Um, and, uh, and then you identify anchor items that test takers have answered correctly within each score band. So it's more like a conditional you know, proportion correct scores. And then when you identify those anchor items, we apply a rule of thumb. And the uh, first rule of thumb is, you know, a minimum 65% of students should have uh, correctly answered uh, the item. Uh, in the past, I think Ms. Rabi argued for 80% actually um, level, which is quite challenging even to meet. So uh, 66, 6, you know, 65% or 0.65 as a proportion correct. Um, with a 30% apart from adjacent anchor uh, levels, and that's another sort of consideration. Um, and salient skills now extracted uh, from those anchor items through more post hoc a, a, a subject matter experts item analysis. In our case, we did two metrics. We already did that work for CDM. The CDM starts with it. Scale anchoring method actually ends with it, right? So we use the same sort of skill specifications to understand the kinds of uh, skills that were assessed by those anchor items. So when we look at the results here, um, the anchor items were identified based on the calculation of conditional uh, p-value again. And as you can see, the total number of anchor items that we extracted actually, uh, not a lot, right? So mostly 6.5, 5, 5, 5, and then at the higher level, we were able to identify eight. eight. However, the issue was actually, it was quite challenging to apply those uh, rules of thumbs, which is what 65% correct. And that was okay. We were able to apply 65% six, uh, cutups to determine anchor items, but finding 30% minimum uh, sort of differentiation uh, from the adjacent levels was very difficult. So we, go, we ran for the 15% as minimum. Um, so overall, uh, the results show that um, even scale anchoring method actually also uh, confirms the CDM uh, uh, result in that the uh, at 6.5 cutoff band score level, inferential uh, reasoning skill, again, is um, uh, sufficiently lower than the other two skills. So with this sort of converging evidence, what we can do is perhaps providing additional information for test takers about what can or cannot be inferred from test scores may be very useful and providing additional so suggestions for developing those untested skills critical for academic success you know, after admission can be considered so that they actually can pay attention to those uh, before admission. So here are some examples of fine print text that we develop and, and, and share uh, through the focus groups with the stakeholders in the study. So now that's the sort of CDM work now, see, bringing CDM work, but also expanding the uh, source of feedback now toward uh, AI infusion. So let's take a look at the automated feedback application. So when you think about it now technological advances, actually a lot of things become possible. So 
automated data processing and scoring approaches afforded by AI help us actualize the all four dimensions that I talked about early on in terms of the agency, multi-agency, as well as where the feedback is coming from, the sources, how we deliver mechanisms, timing, right? So in many ways, I, I feel that the, the technologies and digital first assessment really can fully maximally uh, uh, actualize the feedback dimensions. Um, machine learning approaches uh, relaxes a number of strong statistical assumption constraints that we have. So they can handle data in vivo, they can handle you know, more interactive data as well. And also the advantage is actually, if you're familiar with a machine learning approaches, most of machine learning approaches also incorporate traditional statistical inferential models that modeling approaches that we are very familiar with as well. Right. However, there are challenges, right? So um, challenges, including actually, you know, when you think about the uh, building prediction model, uh, uh, you know, using machine learning, especially supervised mo modeling, you know, uh, we have to rely on human judgment, right? So uh, still human judgment kind of serving as a kind of, you know, reference point, and that causes a lot of troubles uh, from my experience. And I think a lot of studies report similar uh, issues. Um, and also the, the current uh, sort of uh, machines data handling also can cause a bias against the certain subgroups, especially with the automated speech recognition. Um, and also another issue is the black box, right? So uh, oftentimes actually, you know, we don't know much about what, what any, went in and what was used to uh, predict outcome. So how to make the uh, machine learning modeling of applications explainable, I think that's another say catchphrase. And I think as you can see, this is again uh, aligned with earlier uh, mention of the current trend. And I think there's a really healthy conversations about how to make our ML approach more explainable. Um, so here's one study that I wanna share, and this is probably the most recent um, study and in a manuscript form and Hannah, uh, at all uh, uh, led this uh, study and the title the validity in automated essay scoring a closely look with specific writing traits of primary grade students. So in this paper, you know, much majority of um, automated essay scoring model used a holistic scoring method, you know, uh, but current NLP driven AES unlocked the potential for modeling more fine grained trait level uh, um, modeling approaches, right? So you don't have to sort of build a model to predict the total holistic score, but actually you can um, you know, build a uh, machine learning algorithm to predict a trait level uh, score. So in this case, traits include the more discourse level coherence by person in the use of text evidence and you know, organization and quality of ideas. And, and, and these traits were really uh, perceived to be quite challenging to be um, uh, automatically scored by the machine in the past. Second, human judgment. You know, while human scores are used as a regression outcome variable in most supervised machine learning uh, modeling approaches, and they're prone to its own errors, right? So the most common validity evidence that we use in AES um, study is the degree between human machine, um, the degree of agreement between human and machine score, you know, comparability using weighted COPPA and Pearson X, Y, and Z, but also we really need to look at both also human-human uh, comparability as well. I think we just continue um, to be an issue. And uh, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, the explainable uh, ML, I think again, is very important. And black box modeling approaches created directly from data by an algorithm, right? So more like a computationally rather than the theoretically. Um, I really cannot understand how variables are really being combined to make predictions, right? So um, to what extent are you know, automated essay scoring, the writing features theoretically congruent uh, with multiple writing traits, so in both uh, linguistic and discourse level. And uh, those are the kind of questions that we ask in this particular validity uh, study. So here's the uh, interpretive validity argument framework that we developed uh, based on Kane and um, Chappelle's uh, frameworks. Um, 
So systematic interpretive argument validity uh, ar uh, framework is necessary for building validity arguments. So it includes domain definition in terms of you know, the skills and knowledge and abilities that we assess in uh, uh, using uh, AES are still uh, relevant in target domain, age appropriate in this case, because we're assessing young learners and also whether or not actually we're assessing something relevant to student learning. Uh, evaluation, AES, you know, scores themselves are really uh, uh, aligned with a human scores in terms of comparability and agreement rates. Um, the generalization, again, the consistency, accuracy, and uh, whether or not actually the, the, even the machine score, hu machine human score comparability actually fluctuates across occasions and, and groups and, you know, grades in our case, right? So those, those are important uh, questions to ask for validation. Um, X and Y and Z. So um, <clears throat> um, out of all six sort of different domain inferential, uh, the interpretive argument sort of domains in this study, we look at two different inferential domains. One is evaluation and second uh, generalization. I'm not gonna just go over all the details, but pretty much we look at the uh, human machine and human human uh, reliability. Um, and uh, yeah, so two writing tasks are used. Uh, one is the, um, uh, first writing task is on the social media. So students watch a video stimulus first and then pre-write and they write, they write an argumentative essay and they revise and then they submit and then they do self-assessment. The second task is on global warming, as you can see. Um, so here's our AES algorithms work. Um, so two writing samples, the left-hand side uh, writing sample is done by grade three. It's very short and uh, before, after, really there isn't much difference, right? And our AS algorithm actually scores the spelling, um, you know, provide a very high spelling score for, obviously it's very short, but there's nothing wrong with spelling. So it's to some extent makes sense. And here's another uh, writing sample, grade six. And uh, yeah, so you can write much longer and more fully developed and very sophisticated. And the machine recognizes quality by scoring high on most all criteria. So when we evaluate that kind of work, so we look at three most difficult or the hard to measure sort of you know, traits in terms of task fulfillment, um, organization and the coherence OC, and the third is the vocabulary and expression. So overall, um, you know, uh, task fulfillment and organization and coherence show sufficiently high inter-rater uh, reliability and human machine uh, reliability, uh, just based on quadratic weighted kappa and the Pearson correlation coefficient, both being higher than 0.7 as a cutoff. Uh, vocabulary and expression trait actually shows a sufficient human machine reliability, but not human-human uh, actually uh, reliability, which is interesting. And again, I think it is consistent with the literature. Um, the, yeah, and then the next question was again, explainable ML. So we wanted to really see what kind of writing features actually make the final model, you know, to be used for scoring. So uh, task of fulfillment's top features include word frequency, word semantics, capturing argumentative nature of the essay task, and why topic words capture topic relevance, right? So topic feature, a uh, top feature for OC, which is organization and coherence uh, is a um, you know, trigram score uh, reflecting the degree of association between, you know, sort of uh, three word unit based word phrases, punctuation, stylistic features, and the vocab and expression features include low frequency lexes and mostly more uh, lexis level, uh, lexical uh, features. So all uh, uh, quite, you know, theoretically uh, relevant uh, features are included um, uh, in the trace specific algorithms. <laughs> this is uh, uh, Hannah, uh, um, Liam, uh, the first authors, you know, creative idea. I think, uh, again, obviously there's nothing new in the fields, right? So another way to sort of think about the uh, as evaluating the quality of the AES was actually, can the machine or algorithm actually can recognize off topic and, and, and gibberish responses, right? So um, 
Additional evidence was sought by comparing AES algorithm performance in four different conditions. Uh, first condition is original social, social media writing because the algorithms were developed of, uh, upon the social media writing. And then the second was the global warming, which was the second task, but we used the algorithm developed for the first um, task and then applied it to the second uh, task to see whether or not the fit is now compromised. The third condition um, was the uh, we shuffled the words included in the global warming, right? So the word level shuffle. And then the, the last condition was actually letter, uh, letter level uh, random shuffle. Um, um, so which again expect actually poor fit. So yeah, as we expected and hoped, the global warming produced much lower fit values than the original one. But then, yeah, also significantly different uh, across all features. And the third condition, yeah, worse than the second condition, and the last condition being the worst condition of all. So we sort of take this as an indirect evidence supporting the AES algorithm developed for social media actually indeed works best for that own and differentiating its performance in other conditions. Now, in providing automated feedback for students overall, and cognitive performance, a series of age appropriate tasks are used. So first the illusion um, is designed to measure students' phonological awareness as a foundational literacy skill. And we have oral reading allowed. It is used to assess oral reading fluency and oral proficiency is used to, um, with the uh, two less uh, restricted task, which is picture description and uh, story retail hear a story and we tell the story. And then we use two cognitive control tasks as a core variant, short-term memory and then problem uh, pattern uh, solving, uh, puzzle solving. And uh, these are more dif to differentiate students' learning needs a, from language development. So overall, our automated oral fluency and phonological awareness scores are monotonically positively correlated with a grades. Um, because these are developmentally very sensitive uh, constructs. So we wanted to see whether or not the machine automated scores actually will show such pattern, and which is confirmed. Now, here are two read aloud samples. And the first sample is at the 75th percentile. So let me. Finally, then with my English homework, Anton told his mom. His mom gave him a look and asked, Oh, really? I took me, it took me an hour and a half. Now, I better not wait to start my math. Anton quickly took... And then the second uh, reader is to be... I am Anton. Anton. So this second sample hits lower than 50th percentile in grade one, not grade five, according to 2017 fluency norm chart by has um, Brooke and Tyndall. Um, note that these two uh, oral fluency uh, scores are calculated based on the word correct per minute, uh, which pretty much uh, considers the uh, uh, word, uh, the pronunciation accuracy and the speech um, uh, rate. Now the issue is that calculation doesn't include expressiveness, right? So in terms of the uh, expressiveness, smoothness, phrasing, pace, all those in the prosodic elements. So let me play these two adult uh, read aloud speech samples. So these two students are actually reading aloud their own writing summary after watching the lecture. Dr. Ranjan Dram introduces two teaching methods for learning a second language. The first is known as the grammar translation method. The second method is communicated language teaching. The main goal of grammar translation... Yeah, what do you think? It's quite smooth. Um, probably can be more paced. Um, here's a second. Within the lecture, Professor Rajendram introduced two major methods used in the second language teaching field. They are grammarly Transmission, translation method and communicative language teaching. Both of this method. Dr. Ranjan Dram 
introduces to what distinguishes most uh, between these two speech assemblies for you? And I think it is a tough question. So when we try to now, so the current research, this is the current research part we're, we're now uh, investing in the, uh, how do we really incorporate actually these uh, prosodic um, uh, expressive uh, uh, um, elements in human judgment? And I, it's, it's really hard to establish interrater uh, reliability actually in the first place. And, and we, are, we know that actually machine is much, much better um, at capturing these acoustic features that differentiate different uh, um, the expressiveness. Um, so in K-12 educational setting, uh, where a large number of students are from sociolinguistically diverse home environments, teachers need to understand what students' learning needs are. So this is another area of our research and uh, sort of uh, uh, focus right now, and are they developing language proficiency or are they facing any additional cognitive challenges? So we're, you know, uh, looking into uh, ways to make this a bit more, you know, uh, informative so the teacher can use the sort of, you know, assessment tool really getting such more timely and immediate feedback when diagnostic feedback to really uh, inform their decision making and allocate their uh, instructional resources. So here's the uh, one student sample. As so though typical approach we, we consider given the developmental sort of, uh, you know, uh, relationships among these traits, we start with the phonological awareness. So picking one student who is actually a uh, very recent arrival, uh, stay here in English speaking environment last than a two years period, and her phonological awareness performance actually shows 80% correct, which is quite remarkable. And when she performed the oral reading fluency, it's uh, time to work on um, our family. He's it, uh, so the discrepancy that you see, uh, discrepancy in her performance actually between her elision task, which she assesses the phonological awareness and her oral reading fluency actually is quite remarkable. And then when we look at her uh, uh, puzzle solving ability and the fluid reasoning ability, actually she gets about 60% of that. Um, her oral proficiency right now, she can only perform in, in L1, mostly because she just didn't have enough social interaction in English speaking environment yet because of COVID. Overall, our suggestion for parents was, yeah, let's just support our you know, student uh, language development further. And uh, the parent confirmed um, a large to large extent actually how the parent also perceives the child's needs at home. Um, so this is, we want to systematize a, a work like this so that the pathway will be more customized and individualized, but also very diagnostically empirically driven because this is the area that teacher really lacked uh, with no uh, further support in the current system. Now, the lastly, uh, I'd like to consider temporality of feedback that we talked about and especially uh, about its timing in learning oriented assessment. So the dynamics of scaffolding, because when you think about temporality of feedback, it becomes more like a mediation and scaffolding, right? So scaffolding refers to the use of some external support, uh, which she, in this case, feedback, it makes particular learning process possible. And so its goal is transformation of a, a learner's a knowledge state or skill state, right, uh, to the next level. And that scaffolding process in mediated learning oriented environment actually is two way and uh, you know, uh, approach because the level of scaffold is adjusted and adapted based on the learner state. And these two have to couple, have to be coupled, right? Meaning actually they have to co fluence uh, uh, back and forth. And various scaffolding strategies already used in classroom in a context. You know, we, we look at qu student questioning ability, we look at student think aloud ability, uh, mediation and monitoring and XL and Z. Now, with automated feedback actually makes that scaffolding process now more recursive and adaptive. And uh, we kind of play with both actually automated machine feedback along with the human uh, mediated feedback as well. 
and we see the best value uh, uh, output outcome uh, when the human mediation actually is in play. So here's one example of more sort of uh, where to provide feedback in what form. So for example, you know, Balance AI, in Balance AI platform, we encourage students to generate their own questions while reading. So once they read a text and they first um, generate their own question and our research that was published in 2022 this year actually shows a, there's a very clear pattern actually that the quality of student generated question actually predicts their reading ability as well as other uh, more psychological um, uh, aspects. And different text type also uh, uh, correlates or interacts with their uh, uh, questioning ability as well. So here is an example by again, high reading ability and low reading ability. And as you can see, the, the, the quality of their questions is quite remarkably differentiated. So using such um, um, human- I falter when I heard a quiet voice to my left. left. Now, this is a reading task. Reading, you can press next and start answering the questions. Yeah, students now writing on, uh, student is writing on a uh, sort of question and it's a kind of tedious sort of process, but that encouragement is quite remarkable. I think human mediation in this case really and using sort of uh, student generated questions as a sort of uh, immediate feedback so that even student before, before students actually respond to the typical comprehension questions, our uh, suggestion is how about we actually provide feedback on student generated question. If a student generated question is already low like this, their reading comprehension uh, uh, performance is gonna be quite predictable. In such case, actually, the mediation can happen and scaffolding can happen even before a student completes the uh, comprehension questions. So that's the kind of um, reasoning that we're kind of follow. Falter when I Another way you can think of writing as a cycle. You know, there are so many sort of places where, again, the scaffolding feedback can play a role by the machine or by the teacher, by the educator as well. Now, yeah, I'm just gonna, cause it's, I think it's past one. So I'm just gonna skip another sort of video that shows how teacher engages students in a, a human mediation through human mediation uh, to support student writing development. But I just wanna end this talk. Um, comic book. Um, I wanna consider how we can further push the boundary as the word is becoming plurilingual it is very natural to think about how to take advantage of AI and our current work to support multilingual identities. So assessing translanguaging uh, ability can support, um, you know, strengthen and uh, measure multilingual learners' linguistic repertoires and also support learners' metacognitive and metalinguistic competence through translanguaging. So again, this is ongoing research right now. So we have two um, student samples here and the one student came very recently speaking Korean, Chinese, multiple languages, but uh, really uh, English is very emerging, very limited. And therefore her performance uh, can be only done in her first language at this point. So instead of removing or discouraging students, actually let students perform in her most comfortable language. So this student soon will reach this level. Those at Gamer at GG and Cat X Gamer at GG walked up to mom. The mom said hello and gave them each an apple. When the mom turned his back to wash the dishes, a cat X gamer at GG and for breakfast. Mama, ta 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 ta
these students, so she's encouraged to perform in, you know, uh, her the performance in the language that she feels most comfortable. The second case is Chinese in, uh, English bilingual. His interaction with the educator is full of constant code switching, demonstration confidence, right? And actual oral proficiency in both languages. And this is an exciting area of work that can transform the landscape of flower language assessment theoretically and practically. I wanna end here for uh, more discussions rather than me talking. But thank you so much. Thank you um, very much, Eunice. Gary. And we've been collecting some uh, questions in the chat. So um, I can I can read some of those out if you'd like to respond to them. OK. Um, first off was a question about accessing the recording. And so I just want to let everybody know in case they missed it. We, we are recording this, and we hope to. Um, we don't hope to. We will be posting this on our uh, Duolingo English Test YouTube channel shortly, so you'll mm -hmm. be able to see it out, and um, and we'll probably send out an email to let to let you all know. And um, so that's that. But to the actual content questions, let me see. Um, we have one that says regarding the HANA at all study, mm -hmm. it is interesting to see that human human inter-rater reliability was actually lower than human versus AES. And when you compared human versus AES ratings, I was wondering how human ratings were finalized, i.e. Mm -hmm. averaging their ratings or inviting a third rater, et cetera. Um, were there also any unique relationships found mm -hmm. between, between yeah. human and AES ratings? Hi, Sonia. I can't see you, but I know you're there. Uh, yeah, so the human rating process was a typical in terms of training, right, selecting the writing samples first and then, you know, uh, first evaluating the rubric to finalize uh, even before establishing the inter-rated reliability. And uh, once we have and happy with the rubric and then we actually started the, uh, the dual multi uh, rating and uh, a third person playing a moderator role, but really uh, more like collaborative sort of moderation to be the understand where the discrepancies comes and so on. So the inter the human human interrater reliable, I don't know what your experience is like, but it's extremely challenging. Uh, and uh, at writing to some extent, I, I like to say it's a bit easier than speaking, you know, speaking when it comes to the, the you know, the more pragmatic element, the pronunciation element becomes extremely uh, subjective for me personally. So uh, writing in this case, actually the organization and, 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 and the task of fulfillment and uh, vocab and all. Yeah, so pretty much we follow very you know, typical uh, training and third rater X, L, and Z. But what was really interesting though, actually the human human integrator, as you know, always is not perfect, right? And actually it was uh, a slightly lower uh, than uh, for the vocabulary and, and, and expression actually, not all, but um, so that was machine actually did much better with uh, Lexis uh, feature, lexical feature extraction and uh, building the model for that. Cool, thank you. And then we have another question from Alina and she mm -hmm. wonders, how can feedback from high stake assessment um, be made more actionable? Should mm -hmm. such an assessment come with a set of learning resources? Should those resources be aligned with the test domain? Oh, I, I think it's just, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Alina. I think uh, you're probably your last name appeared too many times in the talk. <laughs> yeah. uh, but yes, I think that the early on that the reason why I said maybe the, the current, you know, uh, technological advances and, you know, what we do really can blur the, the, the you know, gaps or even dichotomy, high stakes versus low stakes, classroom versus standardized, like for me, I think it, those distinction can go away. You know, even if let's say high stakes standardized testing is used for decision-making for the mission, as I mentioned in my presentation, still, they are still the same learners. Their learning trajectory doesn't end with the testing or admission actually, they need support, right? So we can actually provide a lot of support actually in such context, one, by, I think it is important, by just letting them know actually these assessments really provide very important information about, it's more like a sampling, it's, it's a sampling domain, right? So what is being really uh, collected and accurately assessed and what is not possibly assessed here because of other issues, right? So making that clearer 
So that students must know, and even faculty, like really the uh, university faculty and staff members, they say they met the admission criteria. By that, they should be able to perform academically. And that's the assumption. And it sounds like duh, but yeah, it is happening. So our argument was actually through our focus groups and work with our you know, different stakeholders was actually there are ways to communicate. You know, there are ways to communicate and informing each other and providing that additional fine prints and resources. Absolutely. You know, maybe a little bit of, you know, what is academic uh, language demands are like. Another really important piece, actually, that academic language demands also vary across different disciplines, right? So students are taking general language proficiency tests, right? However, the kind of language that they must use is going to be very discipline specific. The vocab is going to be very technical, right? And 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 X and Y and Z. So somebody needs to tell them before they enter the university. So that's that's one thing. Like a very simple, friendly letter saying, "Dear, dear Anthony, congrats, good job." But here are things you must know, right? It's something like that, Alina. I don't know. What, uh, and then, of course, doing that, we want to do that more systematically, right? So that's why we bring CDM type of work or scale anchoring, scale anchoring method work that provide that additional descriptive sort of you know uh, uh, information that we can actually facilitate that thinking and communication. That's a good suggestion. Alina also says in the chat, good suggestion. Um, and then we have one um, sort of more, more you know, specific question about uh, trait scoring. Mm -hmm. So um, traits have been shown to be highly intercorrelated. And uh, this is my colleague, Jill. She says she noticed that um, when you, on the slide where you showed mm -hmm. the predictive features, that there was overlap between, for instance, TF and OC. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, she wondered if you looked at the correlation between those trait scores. Excellent, excellent questions. Um, uh, let me ask Hannah and uh, Lalia. I don't know. Are you here? I, we're not even allowing people to talk, right? It's hard. It's hard for them to talk. It's the it's the nature of the platform and everybody out there. I'm sorry. This yes, is a uh, webinar, so yeah. we can see you in yeah. the chat. I, I wish I can just specifically refer to the the coefficient values, but uh, yeah, not in terms of the inter. Uh, uh, trait sort of correlations. I didn't report that. I didn't. We didn't discuss that. But um, typically, when we look at them, usually the correlations are never too high. Because as you know, uh, Jill, like too high correlations actually sometimes defeat the purpose, right? Because we don't want to include all the traits that are too similar and highly correlated. Then what's the point of even further splitting, right? So uh, most of correlations that we see in our current work around is 0 0.6, 0 0.7. It's never higher than that. So we usually take that as evidence that, yeah, still there is enough area for further split. And then, oh, I see, I see, oh, Jill says thank you. You can see the chat. <laughs> Jill says thank you. <laughs> and then the last question I see from Alina wants to know if you think uh, the can-do statements are useful. Hmm. Uh, so, yeah, so the, or proficiency descriptors, right? So the can do is really kind of highlighting this uh, sort of um, positive note for our users, test takers. So it's like, so that you can easily translate those uh, proficiency descriptors into more SAP assessment form so that you can use like, I can do, like, can I, right? So um, I think so, uh, Alena, I think it is very useful. And this is this is really typical uh, sort of approach now we take to make our assessment results or, uh, more descriptive and interpretive because the scores are never interpretive themselves, right? So we need to really substantiate um, those scores using a certain uh, qualifiers and uh, CANDA statements are used for that purpose. So for example, if DET is interested in further supporting our test takers providing student self-assessment more you know, in the form of a can-do sort of statement. Yeah, that's one way to go. Wonderful. Okay, and let me just see. I, I think that's all of, I think that's all the questions and I suppose we're coming up on time. Anthony, did you wanna hop back on and say a few words? Because we, um, this isn't the last webinar that we'll be hosting. And so I will let my colleague Anthony say a few words about that. Thank you so much, Eunice. Thank you. Well, if uh, we don't have any other questions, uh, I don't know if there's time for people to ask questions, but I'll ramble on a little bit. Meanwhile, uh, mm -hmm. I, I want to say thanks, uh, Eunice, uh, for this uh, very informative and uh, thought-provoking 
uh, talk with uh, lots of conceptual and empirical uh, ideas and information that uh, can, you know, inform people uh, who have been listening to develop uh, research agendas and research programs in the area of uh, feedback. So I just wanted to go back and see if I can ask a question while we're looking for uh, any other questions. Um, so the, the paradigm two or three decades ago was that uh, test providers would give a number. Mm -hmm. the, you know, TOFU gave a number, 500 or 550 or 600, whatever. And we were all test takers in that uh, era. And uh, the institution left it to universities to decide, um, do you want to admit this person with a 500 or a 550 or 600 and go for it? And they left it there. But um, along, this has been a long road and now organizations, all institutions provide can-do statements or level descriptors um, that are kind of generic. So if you've got between whatever, 90 and 100, they will give you a generic description. You can do these things. Um, you should improve on these other things. If you've got between 70 and 90, you know, you get another description. So this is at the generic uh, band level or a group level, if you like. But most test takers are individuals. I mean, not most, all test takers are individuals, right? So they want to know how they have done. How can this be done? Is it possible to do this because of um, your AI contribution, you think, from your balanced AI projects? Mm -hmm. uh, I think the, uh, you're raising really important uh, uh, issue and point and something that we can really probably f improve further upon. Uh, so let me say this actually, and I think a Dunlop's study already kind of indicated that like when even the candidate descriptors or proficient descriptors are too generic, so that's better than just scores, right? Better than nothing now, but they are very generic. So how do we make those a bit more customized to the field, right? And personalized. So for me, for our uh, admission testing, I think how we can make such more personalized and special not generic, will be more discipline specificity. Mm. So how do we do that? Because we can't change the skills, right? The core skills that are that descriptors try to capture, keep them. However, because you can sort of you know identify the typical activities and the language demands that are happening in engineering, for example, right? Or like so, for example, the interviews with uh, engineering faculty members. So they're talking about they do a lot of co-op and they do a lot of internship where engineers need to sit with the uh, clients, kind mm. of understand, doing a needs assessment, like understanding and da, 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 and providing the consultation, X, Y, and Z. So that's very important. So that's the communication piece, but then where the problem solving becomes really the analytic mindset, right? So they kind of describe that. And then, so for me, rather than saying, being able to understand the clients, you know, or the, the interlocutors, you know, uh, uh, or something like that, but I, I will use those, you know, right? You know, understanding the client's needs uh, uh, through the interviews and X, Y, and Z. So when you change the language, translate the language that matters to that particular field, it makes sense, right? So I think we can do that work. And of course, you know, more systematic actually domain analysis work has to be done. But once we do that, and now because of um, our AI and all the NLP piece and X, Y, and Z, we can do a larger volume text analysis and X, Y, and Z, and then do that. Build that bank and align them, align them to those generic descriptors so that, that it's a tagging system we do right now. So for example, the work I do right now uh, is actually working with the nursing uh, regulators in Canada, the entire Canadian uh, nursing regulators. They have to set their standards again, X, Y, and Z. So then they they typically use existing tests like IELTS and you know TOEFL or whatever, right? So but they do those tests really have nothing to do with nursing practice, right? Mm -hmm. So how do then make those standards cutouts any relevant to the field? So that's where now we're really creating this large pool of language descriptors, the typical nurse practices that require certain language. So create them and then align them and then use those. So replace the generic language descriptors that are attached to the scores 
with this. Mm, thank you, thank you. Fascinating. Uh, you know, definitely worth uh, thinking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we have uh, uh, come to the end of our uh, uh, talk. I think people are dropping off. So I think it's it indicates that uh, they've got a lot of uh, information and ideas from you. And probably they'll watch the video again, just to uh, repeat that uh, the uh, talk uh, is uh, re being recorded and it will be available. Um, uh, all of you who uh, came in today to watch, uh, to listen uh, to uh, Eunice's talk, you'll be able to listen to it again and think about some of the ideas that she presented. Mm -hmm. So once again, I want to thank you, Eunice, uh, for this wonderful presentation. I also want to remind all the um, uh, viewers that uh, this is an ongoing series and our next uh, speaker is uh, James Purpura. The talk is uh, scheduled for April 22nd. Uh, you will all get uh, invitations for that uh, uh, as well. So through um, from Sophie. So thank you very much and have a good day. Well, thank you so, thank you. so much. Um, do you have time, like one minute to debrief? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I don't know. Uh, Okay. Thank you, everybody. Eunice, tell you what, well, what I can do is just I'll send you a Zoom link and we can meet in another room. It'll probably be a little easier. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And we look forward to the next one.